just a minute about Christmas Eve. If this is your first year with us here at New Life, let me just tell you, Christmas Eve is nuts around here. And um, lots of folks coming, lots of folks uh, hearing the word. I got to tell you, first thing I want to tell you about Christmas Eve, pray for it. And pray for it, yes, that it would go smooth, yes, that a whole lot of people would come. But here's what I really want you to pray for. I want you to pray that the Holy Spirit would use that as an opportunity to speak the gospel and the truth of Jesus Christ to everyone that comes in the door. Because every year at Christmas Eve, we get the opportunity to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ to people who are hearing it for the first time and to people who are actually listening for the first time. There are a lot of people that have been to Christmas Eve services every year of their life. But all of a sudden, for whatever reason, on a given year, this time they listen. And so every year we have the opportunity to do that. And so uh, be praying for that. Now let me tell you how this is going to work. In this room, New Life Church combined with Healing Place Church because they don't have their own building, so they're going to fold back in with us on Christmas Eve. In this room, 2, 4, 6, and 8 on Christmas Eve. Those are our service times. 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 8 o'clock, okay? Can you say that with me? 2, 4, 6, and 8. That should be easy enough to remember, right? All right, those are our worship hours here. Now, let me tell you, be patient as you come in and work with our parking lot folks. They're going to be a little more strict about where they send you on Christmas Eve because although we are doing services at 2, 4, 6, and 8, the Garage Church will be doing services at 5 and 7. So if we take up all their parking spaces and their folks have to park down in the hinterlands down yonder to walk past us to get to their church, they are going to be missing the Christmas spirit by the time they get in the building. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll be a little more we'll be a little more tight with the parking arrangements that evening. Also, you just always anytime we have large services, you got to be patient with the parking lot. If there were a way we could fix it, we would. We we petitioned for an overpass over 3 I'm kidding. And um, <laughs> that's totally a joke. Um, so at any rate, uh, just, just be patient with that, all right? Two, four, six, and eight. You say, you say well, wait a minute, Pastor. I, I want to do, do candlelight communion service for Christmas. That's how we do Christmas. That's our tradition. Got you covered in the chapel building at 9 and 11. All right, in the chapel building at 9 and 11, there will be, uh, there will be Christmas Eve communion, uh, candlelight communion services at 9 and 11 in the chapel building. Okay, so at New Life Church, 2, 4, 6, 8. If you can't make any of those and you, want, and you want to go to one of these earlier services, the Garage Church, 5 and 7. If you want candlelight communion in the chapel at 9 and 11. That's your Christmas Eve services. All kinds of options, pretty much from 2 o'clock in the afternoon until 11 o'clock at night. We got you covered. All right, so uh, just keep all that in mind. Wanted you to know about that. All right, today we are going to begin a new sermon series. And of course, as you might expect, we're going to focus in on Christmas. Our theme for this is priceless, giving a gift that really matters. And, and, and there are a number of things that we want to look at in this sermon series. There are a number of things that are gifts to us from God that we want to learn. Because, you know what? i got to tell you, there's a lot of discussion about Christmas, a lot of debate about Christmas. There's a lot of debate over whether you use the word Christmas, whether it's okay to use the word Christmas. Can a government official use the word Christmas? Can a state have a Christmas tree or must they have a holiday tree? What, what, is, what is all the debate about all this? You know, is it okay? Is it, da, da, da. I think it, I, I got to tell you, I actually find this debate a bit amusing because the folks that want to come against the word Christmas will say, no, 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 we're going to call it a holiday. Lean forward. <laughs> don't tell anybody outside of here because we don't want the folks outside of church to know this. Holiday means holy day. <laughs> Just saying. It's no matter who wins, we win. <laughs> That's because we're on God's side and God always wins, Amen. And so, um, at any rate, all of that conversation, what is Christmas about? And when you ask people that question, what is Christmas really about? Oh, you'll get all kinds of questions. You'll get all kinds of answers. But some general statements come out. Christmas is about peace. Well, let me ask you a question. What does that mean? 
What does peace mean? Does peace mean the absence of conflict? Does peace mean the absence of problems? What does peace mean? Well, we want to unpack that word. And we want to unpack that word looking at the life and the teaching of Jesus Christ, not just as some philosophical approach to the word. So what does Jesus tell us about peace? Another word that comes up all the time is forgiveness. At Christmas time, the word forgiveness comes up a lot. Well, what does forgiveness mean? Well, we don't want to unpack that from the world's perspective or from a philosophical perspective. We want to unpack that word from a perspective of what does this mean in the context of the life of Jesus Christ. Because in the end, Christmas is not what we want to live out. You know how folks say, well, you need to live the spirit of Christmas all year long. <laughs> you know, they say that. Yeah. No, don't try to live out Christmas. Live out Christ. And there's a difference between the two. Because we're not living out a season of the year. We're living out what we learn from the person of God who is the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one who came to deliver us and is the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and Prince of Peace. That's what we're living out. So as we unpack these words, we need to unpack them from the standpoint, from the vantage point of what does Jesus show us in his life about these words. So today we're going to unpack one word that really comes up a lot around Christmas time, and that word is generosity. What does it mean to be generous? What does it mean to give generously? And, and, and I have to tell you, there's a lot of different answers to this question. I mean, come on, how, how would you answer this question? Some of you would say, oh, Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike, well, that's very simple. It's not the gift that counts, it's the thought that counts. That is not true. You do not believe that. You may say that, but you do not believe it. Because if that were true, we would all do our Christmas shopping at the dollar store. And you know it. Oh, it's the thought that counts. So I'm going to make sure I don't have that thought if when I'm in Macy's. You get in the dollar store and you start thinking. Uh-huh. I thought of you. Here's your pencil. Bless you. This is not true. Some of y'all are going, I'm glad he's saying that because the price tag counts. Yes. Hey, y'all, y'all, y'all notice these commercials every year at Christmas time that come out, these car commercials? And folks, we are not talking about normal people cars. It's like Lexus and Mercedes. They want you to give a Lexus for Christmas. A Mercedes, get a red one so you can look like Santa Claus. <laughs> Who does that? And why am I not friends with them? <laughs> do, do, y'all feel the same way I do about this? I look at those commercials and I go, wow, I mean, how do you even do that? Do you like buy the car and say, here's your car? Oh, here's the payment book. <laughs> Bye. But what do you do? The price tag is not really the right definition either of a great gift. Well, well, you know, in the end, I think if we start from the question of what is a great gift, we start at the wrong question. Because today, I'm not going to try to unpack for you how to shop for great gifts. What I want to talk to you about is how to be a person of great generosity. And I think coming out of a, of, a, of a heart and a life that is naturally generous, great gifts naturally emanate. And therefore, we want to change internally what it means to be generous. That's what I want to challenge today. That's the word I want to come against today. And, and I want to do this from, I'll tell you what, read with me our key verse. It's going to be 2 second, second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. Uh, read, let's read this together. Very short verse. Let's read this together. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. So God gave us a gift. And, and that gift is so incredibly awesome that it is indescribable. 
Now that's a good gift. When someone gives a gift that is so awesome that you simply cannot even describe the awesomeness of the gift you've just received, that's a good gift. And that's the gift that God gave us. But that gift of God, which we know is Jesus, which we know is the Christ, which we know is His own Son, that gift of God comes out of the heart of God and comes out of a natural heart of generosity that God has for us. I need you to understand something as we start this. If we are to be like God, we must be generous. Because God is generous. And if our God is generous and we are called to be like Him, then we are called to be a generous people. But let me set the framework in which to think about generosity. And let's do this in 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 9, because verse 15 is the culmination of a story, of a teaching that the Apostle Paul is giving us. So let's look back into that teaching and see what he says to us to get to this phrase that, that says God's indescribable gift. So read this verse with me. Let's read this together. Read with me. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Now some of you are going sowing and reaping. Pastor, what, wait, I thought we were talking about giving away. And now all of a sudden you're on to sowing and reaping. Well, we are talking about generosity and we are talking about giving away. But I, here's really the big place that I need to challenge your thinking. Let me suggest to you that any time you choose to give a gift to someone, you are investing in that person. Let me shift your thinking just a little bit. Whenever you choose to give to a person or an organization, you are investing in that person or in that organization. And you need to see your gift that way. Let me, let me step back one more time. If I give a gift to you, I am saying by the very giving of that gift, I believe that you are worthy of this in some way, shape, or form. And I am now going to invest in who you are by giving you some of what I have. Let me back up again. God's indescribable gift is his son Jesus. Now let me blow your mind. God believes somehow that we are so valuable that we are worthy somehow of the investment of His own Son into our lives. Jesus being sent to this earth is not just God doing something arbitrarily kind. This is God investing in who we are. And Jesus is, His life, His blood, His death, His resurrection, is an investment in us. Don't ever miss that. And therefore, God expects a return from us. God's gift to us is a statement to us. We matter so much to God that He would invest in us His own Son. Now, I want you to notice something in that gift, in that investment. God, when He chose and decided and saw in his heart and mind that we were worthy of being invested in by him. God did not skimp on that investment. When he found an investment that was worthy, he, and here's your first point, maximized his investment. Might I suggest that a generous heart learns to hear from God where investment is worthwhile. And when they hear from God where investment is worthwhile, they maximize their investment. I think when God shows us a place that we can invest, when God shows us people we can give to, when God shows us how to be generous, when God shows us where to be generous, we need to be generous, oh, dare I say this, with abandon. Our generosity, when it is driven by God, can be done almost with abandon. Because what God has shown us is somewhere we can invest 
in what he's doing. We can invest in what God is doing in another person. We can invest in what God is doing in another organization. We can invest in what God is doing in this world on this planet. And he allows us to have that privilege. Hey, let me challenge your thinking just a minute. What if you viewed every gift you gave your child as an investment in your child? How would that change the way you shop? See, all the teenagers and kids in the room are going, Preacher, shut up. (laughs) Be quiet, Preacher. You're about to make her buy me like books and stuff. It sure would shift it in some ways because most of what we buy for our children rot out their teeth or their brains. That's not a good investment. Honestly. You say, well, all the other children have it. Okay, don't give it to your child because so your child can actually learn to think and then your child will be the leader because the rest of them have rotten brains. See, I don't give much applause on that. The teenagers are grabbing their mama's hand going, don't you clap. Don't do it. I mean, we look, I'm not suggesting. I, I look, if you whatever you want to buy, it's okay. I'm not here to come against you. I'm not doing that. I'm shifting your thinking. Because really, a gift to anyone is an investment in them. And we need to see it that way. God's gift to us is God's investment in us. And his investment in us is huge. He certainly maximized his investment. Read this next verse with me. Let's read this together. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I mean, try that again. Read one more time. Let's read this again. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Here's the second thing I want you to understand about generosity. Generosity should be done on purpose, not by accident. Generosity that is real, generosity that is true, is done on purpose, not by accident. God guides us to a place or a person or an organization that we invest in. And then, and then, and then, listen to me, and then we think and we pray and we plan for how we will do this giving. Look at this verse again. Put it back up on the screen. Each man should give what he has what? Decided. Decided where? In his heart. In his own heart. Listen, this is not, this is not a matter. Look, listen. Listen. You should never be pumped into being generous. You say, oh, come on, pastor. Come on, pastor. Come on, come on. You need to do it. You're there. You know what I could do? Let me tell you what I could do. I could, I could start to talk to you about seed money. Oh, I could. Oh, I could preach that sermon. Oh, you need to take out some money. Oh, brothers and sisters, get out your wallets. Reach down inside your wallets because God wants to take what's in your wallet and he wants to multiply it today. Go get the offering plates because we're going to take up an offering. we got to multiply what's in the wallet today. Reach down and God can take Oh, what God can do with what's in your wallet. Take out your wallet, brother. And you would be punked into giving by a preacher. You should never be punked into giving by a preacher. Amen. Oh, let's hit somebody else. You should never be punked into giving by a teenager. Oh, see, I'm going to get ugly now. You should never be punked into giving by a three-year-old. Listen, God knew what he was doing when he did not give me daughters. It would be ugly. Daddy. I'd be in debtor's prison today if I had a daughter. You understand what I'm saying? If we have grandchildren, God might give me a granddaughter because I might be able to handle myself by that point. You know? Okay, honey, whatever you want. (laughs) 
No, really, son, she wanted $10,000. I gave her nine. <laughs> you know what I mean? It would be over. But you, you listen, you need to plan through these things. Okay, watch, 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 watch. You need to maximize your investment, and then you need to check your motive. You need to check your motive. Now, there's a couple things going to happen here when we check our motives. Number one, we're going to think through how we give. We're going to think through how we give. Can I give you some advice before you go Christmas shopping? Figure out, decide in your heart what you're going to do before you get to the mall. Please? Here's the way this goes. It's real simple, actually. It's not complex. I make that much, right? Some of y'all are going to know this much. Stay with me. I make that much. Now, remember 101080. Y'all remember 101080? So that all comes off top, 80%. Hey, y'all, Christmas has to happen in the 80. You're saying? So Christmas, is, okay, here's what I got left. This is my 80. Now it's going to drop on down because I got bills. And after bills, I got that. Okay, Christmas needs to happen in there. Well, what am I going to do in there? Y'all follow what I'm saying, right? This is not complex. It's a rocket science. All right? And, and you say, okay, that's what, okay. All right, now, mm, wow. That's not going to be easy, preacher. It's all right. Take some time and think about it. So take this. <laughs> go to the dollar store. <laughs> take this. Figure out what it is. And then think through and decide in your heart what you're going to do. Make a list. Go to the mall. And you won't be broke come January. Listen, for those of you who do not make a list before you go shopping, I'm going to have a special class for you in January. <laughs> it's going to be on depression. All right? Now, come on. Come on now. Plan through it. Think about it. You know the other thing that's going to happen when we check our motive? You're not. You're going to realize you're going to be able to live in this tension. Every gift I give is an investment in another person. I don't give the gift to get a return. There's, there's a tension in there. Both of these are true. Both of these are, re, are, are reality because if you give the gift just to get a return, it's not a gift anymore. You see? But there will be a return from it. It is, a re, it is an investment, but you're giving it for a different reason. I invest in my children with gifts. I invest in my bank. I expect different outcomes. I do this for different reasons. The truth is, we have to think through all of these so we check our motives. So we, so we maximize our investment, okay, because it's an investment, and then we check our motive. Now, let me be honest. I could stop the sermon right here because that alone will change the way you handle generosity and money and giving in your life. I could stop the sermon right here. But if I do, I won't prepare you for the outcome of this new way of thinking and living. And I've got to prepare you for the outcome of this new way of thinking and living. Read this last verse with me. Let's read together. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. Do you see that? In all things... At all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God is saying to us something that is true. And you, and you need to understand this. A lot, of, a lot of folks say, well, okay, pastor, why is name it and claim it or seed faith theology so popular? The reason is there's truth in it. There is truth in it. If you become a generous person, that generosity of yours will have an effect on the rest of your life. There will be a payout from that. Now, from the world's perspective, let's look at it from the world's perspective. If I start giving money to people and I become known as a generous person, I will suddenly meet a lot of people who need generous people. 
You know this to be true. If you become generous and become known as a generous person, people who want you to give to them or to their cause will suddenly find you out. Because you've been known. You, need, you don't need to be surprised by that. You need to be ready for that. You need to know that that's going to happen. And you need to process the fact that that's not entirely a negative thing. But there's a flip side to this. Because God says that if I will follow his way of doing this, he will provide for me at all times, in all ways, so that all I need, I have. Generosity results in God blessing me further. Listen carefully. When God sees you as someone he can trust to rightly handle his blessing, he will give you more of his blessing. And that should not shock you. We should be maximizing our investment. We should be checking our motive. And we should be anticipating our return. There's going to be a return to this way of living. And it should not shock you. You know what the Bible says? I, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you a hard verse. This is a hard scripture. It's a difficult scripture for people to unpack. But these are the words of Jesus. We have to process them. They are the words of Jesus. Jesus says, To him who has much, he will be given more. And to him who has little, even what he has will be taken from him. That is a difficult statement. And we don't like that statement. And we say to ourselves, well, it shouldn't be that way. But, but, but we know. I mean, you look around yourself. You look at the world around you. And you know intuitively we can see that truth being lived out in the world around us on a daily basis. The one who has plenty ends up with more. The one who doesn't have enough ends up with even less than what he has to start out with. We see that lived out every day, and we get upset. We say, well, you, just, just stop it. This has got to stop. That's not fair. Somebody needs to pass a law. Can I, can I teach you something? Laws won't solve this problem. You know why? Because people who know how to find money are people who know how to find money. Profound, ain't it? And listen, let me tell you something. If there's money to be had in business, then people who know how to find money will get into business. The government says, oh, we don't like that. So they pass laws. And now all the money's in the government, which means that people who know how to find money will find their way into government. You say, well, pastor, that sounds pretty hopeless. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Because God invests in people who give, while the world invests in people who take. The answer is not laws. The answer is Jesus Christ. The answer is not a new system of law. The answer, the answer is a new system of living based on the person of Jesus Christ. And God will take care of those who will take care of those that God has called them to take care of. Y'all understand what I just said? I'm going to say it again. God will take care of those who take care of those whom God has called them to take care of. Because God's investing in you. He's giving you what you don't deserve and asking you to handle it the way that He calls you to. So, when God shows us a place to invest, we should maximize our investment. 
And then we should check our motive and make sure we're not just investing for our own needs, our own desires. We should think through what we're going to give so we don't get punked into it. So we're doing it on purpose. And then we should expect, anticipate the return that comes to us as a result. Now, I'll tell you, this actually works. Absolutely works. And, and I, can, I can demonstrate it. You can demonstrate it. The truth is, I, I'm about to write an article, I think, for the Wesleyan uh, magazine. And that article, if, if, I, if I get it written, it'll be titled this. 2100 minus 250 equals 2200. 2100, listen to it, minus 250 equals 2200. So preacher, how does that work? That math ain't right. Well, you really were a music major, weren't you? (laughs) (laughs) You see, if you take the average attendance of New Life Church prior to November, the average attendance of New Life Church is just under 2,100. At, at the last Sunday in October, starting, with, starting into the November, we planted Healing Place Church. Over that time frame, averaging out about 250 people a week attend Healing Place Church. In November... New Life Church averaged just under 2,200 in attendance. So 2,100 minus 250 equals 2,200. You say, that math is messed up. No, that math is God's. (laughs) And that comes from a heart of generosity that exists within this church. There's a reason God blesses what we do Years ago, I I mean, it must have been the first year I got here. We we were were running a budget of maybe $150,000 a year. I think that was about what we were running a budget of. We had $3,500 in our bank account. First year. I'm convinced now, 14 years later, God was testing us. A church came up with a real need. It was, it was valid and it was viable. And that need was going to cost this other church, not a Wesleyan church, just a local church, $3,500. I went to the board and I said, this church needs $3,500. I think it's a good request and I'd like for us to partner with them. I don't know why. I'm just praying about it. I feel like we should. They said they need $3,500. I said, yes. They said, how much money do we have? I said, $3,500. Well, are they going to pay it back? Well, they're, they're, they're offering to, but I just don't believe they're going to have the capacity to do that. And further, I mean, really, are you going to chase them down for it? So, no, we're giving this away. If it comes back, that's all good. If it doesn't, it's okay. That board sat there and we debated it. We didn't have an argument. We just debated it. We prayed about it. And they said, okay, let's give it all away. And we gave away $3,500, everything we had. (laughs) Today, this year, New Life will approach $3 million in total income. (laughs) Some of y'all are thinking, boy, I want my check back. (laughs) Stop it! (laughs) Do you know how expensive it is to run this place? Y'all, y'all, y'all eat two and a half million dollars worth of cookies. <laughs> God will work that way for you. You say, oh, I got it, preacher. I'm going to give five dollars and God's going to give me back a hundred. Mm-hmm. Point two, check your motive. <laughs> oh, okay, well, what am I supposed to do? Go back to point one. Wait for God to show you an opportunity, and when he gives you an opportunity to invest, maximize your investment. Go to point two. 
think through how you're going to do that. I suggest you go to point two while you're waiting on point one so that you have yourself prepared for point one when point one opens itself up. And point three, just wait for what God's going to do and be amazed by the graciousness and the generosity of our God because we are being generous to try to be like our God, but we will never, ever accomplish being as generous as our God. He can always outgive you. And in the end, perhaps, just perhaps, they can say of our lives what they said of Jesus' life. Look at this verse we started out with again. Read it with me again. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. What if that gift could one day be you? What if somebody would say, Lord, thank you for your indescribable gift of Jesus. And thank you for the indescribable gift you've given me of her or of him. That's how God wants us to live out our lives. In generosity. Father, I ask that you would begin to speak into our hearts and minds. Lord, we are bombarded this time of year with commercials and pleas and letters and, and ideas of, of things we need to buy or things we need to give away or, or things we need to donate to. And Lord, so many of them look good and look meaningful and look positive. So many of them make sense, Lord. But Lord, as we begin to unpack this, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to our hearts and minds that you would clearly illuminate for us the areas where you want us to invest, the people you want us to invest in with our gifts, the organizations you want us to invest in with our gifts. Lord, help us to see that. And when we see it, Lord, teach us not to, be, not, not to skimp on what we give, but let us maximize our investment in what you've called us to. And then, Lord, I pray that you would help us to think clearly through how we would do that. Question and work through our own motives. Figure out why we feel like we want to do this and why. And, and, and process whether or not this is actually from you. But, Lord, as you do this in us, let us not be surprised or shocked by the, recha the, re the changed results in our lives. Let us instead, Lord, know that we are giving by the call of a God who is so generous that we could never outgive Him. You are the God who gave us your very self. You are the God who gave us your very Son. Your presence with us is the indescribable gift in our lives. Let us celebrate it and let us give you praise for it. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us?